All right, so here we go. We're going to talk about force on a moving charge due to a magnetic field. Let's say <clears throat> I'm holding an electron in my hand. And let's also pretend like there's a magnetic field in this room. Is there a magnetic field in this room? Yes. Yeah, do you know which way it points? That way. Which way is north? Somewhere that way, okay. Yeah, so yeah, every, everybody way. pull out way. your field fingers and, and make a field. All right, good. Wait, is that way north? Yeah, yeah that way's north. Yeah. Do film field lines point away? <laughs> no, they point that way. There's a piece it of It goes there. whoop up towards the north pole and then into the... Okay. Yeah, so that way's north. All right. So, all right, look up at my hand. I have an electron in my hand. Is that field pushing on this electron? Yes no. or no? Yeah. No. Not no. Unless it's moving. Ha ha! It is not pushing on the electron because... It's not moving. Yeah, the field only pushes on the electron if the electron is moving. Good? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a weird thing about magnetic fields. We know if there were an electric field in this room, the electron would get pushed that way, right? But if, since it's a magnetic field, it's not going to get pushed unless it's moving. Now, if it is moving, what direction does it get pushed? You guys know how to do this from last year? I feel like you can push it in like a circle. Let's say, I thought it was like let's say I were to throw this electron whoo, toward the back of the room. It's flying through the air. What direction is it moving? Perpendicular to the field. See, it's moving that way, right? Wait, what? Are you throwing it that yeah, way? It's moving, yeah, okay, it's moving yeah, back okay. towards the back of the room. <laughs> the field's towards the right side of the room. Yeah. The electron's moving to the back of the room. What way does the magnetic field push the electron? I don't know. Let's try it. Uh, it it doesn't. Did it get pushed? It towards didn't. the back of the room? It, no. no, it didn't get pushed. <laughs> Let's see. Wait, it's an electron, so how about we use the left hand? Field. Oh, jeez. Oh, look, it was motion. <laughs> Direction of motion. What way does it get pushed? Down. Down. You actually saw it. Cool demo, huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So, that's my cool demo for the day. Yeah. No, that's, that actually would be, if this were an electron and it were moving in a magnetic field at an appropriate speed, it would be pushed down from the field. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. And if it were a proton, which way would it be pushed? Up uh, to go whoop. They need some proton baseballs. Proton baseballs. I do need some proton baseballs. Um, yeah, you could probably hurt some of the proton Now, baseballs. interesting question. If the field were going the other way, and I threw it back toward the back of the room, which way would the ball be pushed? Up. 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 Okay, good. Huh. Ah, it's, it's interesting, right? And it's a, it's a manifestation of the right-hand rule. Um, and, and the manifestation is... Oops, is QV cross B. The force, the magnetic force is QV cross B. What's Q? Charge. Charge was B. The velocity, or in the case of this, the direction it's moving. Right? And what's B? The magnetic field stream. So how do you do a cross product? How do you get the direction of a cross product? Oh, it's the normal to Right hand rule. Right hand rule. Right? This is the cross product you do with the right hand rule. Doesn't matter. How many times, by the way, have we done cross products so far in this class? Once. Oh, three. Sorry, my bad. Three, right. Uh, when was the first time we did a cross product? Do you remember? It was actually first semester. Whoa. Do you guys remember? First cross product we ever did? No, not impulse? Torque. Remember, torque equals R cross F? Oh. Right? R cross F, R F sine theta. And then this, what was the second time we did it? We never did it in electrostatics. The second time we did it was with um, 
Bio Savar was a cross product. IDL cross R over R cubed. What's the last time? The most recent time? Right here. QV cross B, or QVB sine theta. All right? So pretty much any time we had something, something sine theta, it was usually because it was a cross product. And it's been three times so far. So, cross product, I think when you did cross product last year, you were just talking about magnetism. But this year, know that cross product is, is it's a general idea. It's applicable to Biosavar, it's applicable to QVB sine theta, it's applicable to torque. Um, and yeah, so just be aware of that. All right, and to solve the cross product, or to get the direction of the cross product, you always use right hand rule. All right, fine. Um, so, let's take a field trip. All right, so we talked about, um, we talked about in the back of the room what way you would actually move, and the fact that you'd actually, once you entered the magnetic field, you'd be forced to go in a semicircle, and also you would be going in uniform circular motion, which means the magnetic field is neither speeding you up nor slowing you down, it's just changing your direction. All right? So, one of the, use, one of the uses for this idea is uh, something called a cyclotron. And a cyclotron, I didn't do a very good job of drawing the actual machine, but the basic idea is you can make a particle go around in a circle. Um, and if you apply some electric fields, you can also cause the particle to speed up too. And that's pretty cool. And you can make it go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. Until, and, and, and the really neat thing is if you have, say, two, like, um, I don't know, two hydrogen nuclei or two helium nuclei or whatever, one going one direction, one going the other direction, and then you slam them into each other, then you can get cool stuff to happen. Let's go to Fermilab. Yeah, Fermilab, right. So, uh, yeah, that's, it's one of, the, one of the ways we do high energy physics. Uh, so, anyway, particle accelerator. The magnetic field doesn't actually accelerate the particle. It just changes its direction, allows it to go in the circle. All right, so here's the actual mathy part of it. Uh, we know from last year the force was QV cross B. Now, we also know that a cross product is nothing more than QVB sine theta, and then you use the right-hand rule to get the direction of the force. All right? So, um, let's say you had a proton in a magnetic field going roundy, roundy, roundy. Why is it going roundy, roundy, roundy? What's the reason? It's there's a force. What way is the force pointing? Towards the middle. What's the name of that force? No, centripetal is not the name of a force. Magnetic force. The magnetic force. Centripetal is the name of the direction that the force is pointing. No, there's... That's just like saying it's an X force or a Z force or a Y force. All right, it's called... It's the, the force is applied in this centripetal Right, the force is applied in the centripetal direction. And if you use Newton's second law and the only force on it is the magnetic force, you can say... Any force that's in the centripetal direction has to equal mass times the centripetal acceleration, right? So, what's the force in the centripetal direction called? Magnetic. So it's QVB sine theta. Now, interesting question. What's theta? It is always 90 degrees. Always 90 degrees for magnetic force, which is really, really nice. Assuming you particle is moving freely because the sine theta goes away. So you got QVB equals MV squared over R. And basically, this comes back to, I can't remember whose, whose question it was, but what if you're going faster? Well, what happens if you're going faster? The circle gets bigger. The circle gets bigger. Because you do, the little, do a little bit of algebra, you get the radius of the circle equals MV over QB. Um... Now, that's interesting. It basically says the radius of the circle is going to depend on four things. 
what does the radius of the circle depend on? The mass of the particle, the speed of the particle, the charge of the particle, and the magnetic field strength. What if, what if you are able to construct a device, and I unfortunately didn't put a picture on, of one on here, what if you were able to construct a device such that you knew how strong the magnetic field was, you could measure the radius of the circle that it made, and you knew how fast the particle was coming in, what could you determine? The mass of the particle. Oh, isn't that interesting? Does anyone know of such a device that does this? Does what? A device <clears throat> that you can shoot charged particles into, and by measuring the radius of the circle it makes, determine the mass of the particle. Does anyone know what this device is called? Has anyone actually used one before? No, not an electron microscope. It, it, it's something that is used a lot in biology and chemistry. All right, so the setup looks like this. Magnetic field inside the device. Strong magnetic field inside the device. Oh, that's that right too. Particles are shot in here. Particles, depending on how massive they are, make either a smaller or a bigger circle. Oh, the what's that called? The, the thing that you the light with the gas. That's what I'm saying. The light with the gas. No, this isn't a cathode ray tube. The spectroscope. Mass spectrometer. A mass spectrometer. What does a mass spectrometer do? Well, it'll give off different wavelengths of light. No, no, it doesn't give off different wavelengths of light. It, you, you have a little x-ray film that senses a dot here, a dot here, a really bright dot here, and a dot here. Shoot a bunch of particles in, and you can tell exactly how massive the particles are. So, let's say you have a sample of, I don't know, what would you take a sample of? Um, human hair. And you wanted to know exactly what chemicals are in that hair. What would you do? Well, shoot particles, I guess. You, tune, you turn it into a bunch of ions, ionize all the chemicals, shoot it through the mass spec, and basically what you get is this dot pattern on the x-ray film. Can we see this machine in action? Because I don't have one here. We don't have one. Either. No, we don't have a mass spectrometer here. <laughs> All right. Let's say, for example, that this radius of a circle corresponded to one proton. This radius of a circle corresponded to two, this one three, this one four, this one five. Do you see how this is useful? Yeah. And you can get basically the mass of every single thing, every single atom, and the relative concentrations based on the brightness. Okay, so if I were to break my hair into ions, yes. is it one, how do you know only one element comprises the hair? Oh, only what? <laughs> many, many elements comprise your hair. Okay, so then what so, if I shoot it into there? What, would what, if, uh, what if you were, had an, a, I don't know, a sample of Beethoven's hair? Okay. Or, or, or Newton's hair. He was an alchemist. Do you know that? Yeah. Did you try making stuff in the gold? Yeah. And apparently alchemists had this problem. Uh, they messed around with mercury a lot.
Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mess around with mercury a lot, guess what happens? You die. You die. <laughs> guess what you can determine with a mass spec from a hair sample? The concentration of mercury inside their pool. Right. The amount of mercury in their system. So that's what you use it for? Yeah. So oh, so you could like if you if someone like died, you could use yeah, you could you could determine the uh, cause of death, okay. poisoning, for example. Well, what happens at the and if you find nothing in the hair, then, then you, you rule out poisoning. Yeah, if you find nothing, then you can't draw that much of a conclusion from it. But if you find something, then it's pretty convincing, right? Uh, and that's just one of many, 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 many uses of a mass spec. Um, but a mass spec is a way to analyze chemicals. And the way it works is with this idea of a magnetic field and a charged particle. All right? Super, super useful, especially if you're into chemistry. All right? Uh, this is one of the many ways that we determine... Oh, here's a question. You know in chemistry class when they said... I don't know, hydrogen peroxide is uh, two oxygens and two hydrogens. How do they know that? They shot it into this thingamajig. Mass spec. Mass Wait. spec. What, how recent is this mass spectrometer? Is it like oh, gosh, I don't know. When did they figure out about magnetism? 150 years ago, 180 years ago, and when do they start making these things? I don't know, after they had electricity. So it's been around a while. I don't know. They need x-ray film, right? Yeah, well, how, what's it take to make a mass spec? A strong magnet, uh, electricity, and an x-ray film. And then a way to accelerate your particles and ionize your particles. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not, it might be 50-year-old, 60-year-old technology. So, yeah, this is one of the many ways that they can determine the chemical makeup of a sample of something. All right? And not just the chemical makeup of it, but the exact atoms that are in it. So, yeah, so mass spec is pretty cool. Uh, there are other ways that they can develop those pretty pictures that are in your chemistry book uh, that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, one of which you might have touched on last year is called X-ray crystallography, um, where you shoot, uh, you make a crystal of something and you shoot X-rays at it. I don't know. You would have talked about it if you talked about it during wavelength of light, but I think I was maybe the only person who did it when I taught AP physics. B. But uh, anyway, pretty cool. I don't know about you guys, but one of the things that always bothered me when I was in high school in chemistry class is they said this is what a water molecule looks like. And you're like, how do you know? <laughs> Have you ever seen one? <laughs> All right. They're too small to see. You can't see a water molecule with visible light. I know, but how do you know it's that shape? I doubt they're seeing that. They're just like, okay, this is the idea. Could, could you determine it with data? The shape? The shape. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. How? Yes, you can. Absolutely. How do you know? Well, one way, I mean, you can use mass spec to, re to, to get the fact that it's hydrogen and oxygen. We know that. Right? But how do you know it's bent? I forget how they know that. You, because you were never taught how they know that. All right? You can get that with x-ray crystallography. All right? And it turns out the different diffraction patterns correspond to different shapes. So, anyway. Uh, anyway, that was one thing that just absolutely infuriated me in, with my chemistry teacher. Every time I'd ask that question, they would be like, I don't know, it's in the book. That's like, funny. how did he get in the book in the first place? How did they figure that out? And he had no idea. So, anyway. That's, did you email? I just, I just made, it made me so mad that so many times in high school I was asked to press the I believe button and just say, just, just believe, just, just believe it. Like, ah. So anyway, um, one of my goals in this class is to cure you of that, of pressing just the I believe button. All right, anyway, moving on. So that is a cyclotron, which is a way to accelerate particles. It's also how the mass spectrometer works. 
Uh, all right, next one. Oh, cathode ray tube television. Who has one of these? We used yeah, one in the basement. Uh, actually, we still the have really them. old ones from like heavy. when I was in college. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. So the big heavy ones that are. Has anyone ever seen one before? Yeah. Okay. Good. I like in five years. They're like I have no idea what you're talking about. Took one apart. It's like this, like Yeah. Why? Why are those TVs so deep? They use vacuum. Like, how does it work? They're shooting light rays instead of like trends. Like that's a trend. Like, like. Oh, and why are they so heavy? Have you ever picked one of those things up? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so here's the basic. I don't have a very good picture in the, in the notes. I'm going to draw a more realistic picture on the board. Here's the screen in the front. It's kind of curved, right? And then back here, back here you have parallel plates. Why do you need parallel plates? Why do you need parallel plates? To accelerate the particle. Can magnets accelerate a particle? I, I rather, yes they can. Can magnets make a particle speed up? No. 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 So what do you need to make the particle speed up? So what you do is you charge up this plate negative, this plate positive, do it to about 6,000 volts or so, or 20,000 volts. I can't remember what the voltage difference is in one of those TVs. It's big though. Um, and then that causes the electrons to hop off this plate towards this plate, right? However, the positive plate has a hole in it. Why? So that the particles can be reduced. So some of the particles go zoop and zip right through. All right. What is this right here? Magnets. Those are magnets. Why do you need magnets? Right, because otherwise your TV would consist of a little white dot in the middle of the screen. <laughs> and that would be boring. <laughs> Not as boring as, say, I don't know, uh, reality TV, but pretty boring. All right. So, yeah, it'd be a little light dot in the center of the screen, which is not very interesting television. So, what do you do to cause that dot to move? Magnetic field. Let's say you had a magnetic field with a north here and a south here. What way would the, the electron beam bend? Everybody pull out your left hand. All right, which way is the magnetic field point? No. Uh, from north to south. Down. What way is the electron moving? Ah, because Earth is, uh, the South Pole is actually up in Canada and the North Pole is actually down in Antarctica. Remember that? Earth is backward. Yes. <laughs> compass, compass aligns itself with the magnetic field. The magnetic field points that way. <laughs> All right, I thought, I thought we did this earlier, apparently not. Earth's magnetic field goes like this. Why would it point towards Australia? Shut up, I'm talking about the South. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's Alaska, here's Canada, here's Greenland, here's South America, right, here's Europe. Right? Here's Africa. All right. And then here's Antarctica. Okay. <laughs> the East. <laughs> All right. So Earth's magnetic field looks like this. Earth's magnetic field looks like this. Which way does the compass point? Compass points... that way. Why? What's the job of a compass? A and don't say point north. It aligns itself with the magnetic field. All right, compasses align themselves with the magnetic field, which if you're sitting right here in Africa, it's going to point that way. 
All right. But we also know that if you have a bar magnet with a north end and a south end, the field comes out of the north end and into the south end, right? So, where's the magnetic north pole? Down here in Antarctica. Got it? Don't get it. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> Is it because the, sometimes the poles switch? It's because when they first started calling things, the, the magnets, the compass north and south, they said, well, we already know north is up near, like, Helsinki, right? Oh, so they just screwed up. And then, and then they said, and then they took a compass, which they realized was just a bar magnet. They took a bar magnet, made it float, or take a cork and stick a thing in it so it floats. And then it started pointing towards Helsinki, and they're like, oh, this end of the compass points towards Helsinki. That they, if you have a magnet, that's the north end, that's the south end. That's how they labeled everything. All right? And then I don't know if they considered the Earth as a big magnet, because if they did, they would have realized that that means that the magnetic north pole has to be the geographic south pole. They just weren't thinking. I mean, they did this a thousand years ago. Actually, Chinese did it two thousand, three thousand years ago. So yeah. So we're actually. No, I don't like this. I don't like this. All right, moving on. So back to my original question: Which way does the magnetic field point outside this ma These two magnets. Points down. Okay, the magnetic field is down. Everybody pull out your left hand. Push towards us. So, this particular set of magnets would push the beam toward this side of the screen. Right? Now, so now we have a dot on the left side of the screen. Whoop-dee-doo! Is that very interesting television? Very only slightly more interesting than having a dot on the center of the screen. <laughs> okay, so how do we make something where it's more than just one dot? Actually, you got to scan across the screen. How do you make this thing scan across the screen sideways? By instead of using big permanent magnets, you use electromagnets where you can control the magnetic field strength. The stronger the magnetic field is, the farther to the left the dot appears. And it gets weaker, and zero, it's in the middle of the screen. Then you swap the north and south, and it starts going to the right side of the screen. So in that way, you control right and left of the scanning dot. But we don't, we don't want just a line across the screen. What do we want? Full screen. A full screen. So how do you go up and down? You need another set of magnets that are in and out. That control the up and down. So you have two sets of magnets. You go, and this is how an old CRTV works. It scans across, goes top row, next 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 row. When it's done painting the whole screen, it goes back up to the top, paints everything over again. That's why you have the little flickery effect. Ever done this in front of the TV with your hand? Yep because it's painting the screen over and over and over and over again. And uh, typically it'd, it'd scan uh, 60 times a second, um, which means that it's refresh rate, I think, in order to get all the pets, it's like 70,000, let's see, a line, each line would take like a uh, couple, uh, like, I don't know how many lines down is there, 480? or 240, and then 240 again. So 60 times 240, is, and then, and then, yeah. So you get this, this. Yes, that's exactly why it gets a huge static charge on the screen, because a bunch of electrons are ramming into it all the time. Um, and the way you go <laughs> with your fingers. How do they control the color? Ah, color is neat. The way you do color on one of those screens, 
is if you look at the screen really, really closely, I don't know if anyone stared too close at the screen and your parents told you, don't do that, you'll lose your eyesight. No, that's total garbage. <laughs> it, yeah, it might hurt your eyes, but you're not going to go blind. <laughs> that's what my parents told me. All right, so really old school TVs, you had a red, a green, and a blue dot in a triangle shape. Um, and I, I'm, look, I'm missing my red marker. Let's pretend like this is red, not green. For those of you who are colorblind, it won't matter. <laughs> All right, so a red dot, a green dot, and a blue dot. All right, and what it does is actually the TV, a color TV, this is why it took such a long time to invent color television instead of just black and white. The color TV actually is smart enough to aim that beam at that particular dot on this screen. And that dot will only grow, glow if an electron is striking it. So it knows that in order to do color, in order to paint a color, it needs to shoot so many electrons at this one, fewer electrons at the... Say, say you wanted to do um, the color yellow. Do you guys remember color mix? Oh, you never did color mixing. You guys know yellow is red plus green? So what you would do is you would steer like 10 electrons at the red, followed by 10 electrons at the green, and no electrons at the blue. And that'll give you a yellow. Yeah, that's how you do all the colors of the rainbow, is red, green, and blue phosphorus. All right? So yeah, and it'll scan across. And you think how many of these uh, pixel combinations, three color combinations, are you need across the whole screen in, in order to get a full picture? It's a lot. Right? Um, a lot, say, maybe you need about uh, 480 down that way and about 640 over this way in an old TV. So 480 times 600 and 40 times 3. And you have to do that every 30th of a second. Or sorry, 30 times a second, rather. So, anyway. Yep, just shooting it through the blue. Through the blue. Do they get shades? Uh, by shooting different numbers of electrons. Say if you want it to be twice as bright, you shoot twice as many electrons at that pixel. All right. Uh, last one is a Hall Effect probe. Oh. Anyone ever wonder how, like, did you guys do a lab last year where you measured magnetic field strength? No. Don't think so. I know. They're doing it this year. Like, isn't there some device that you can measure how strong a magnetic field is? Sure there like, is. shouldn't be there be some device that you could tell how many Tesla exists? Like, I should be able to hold it in this room, and it should be able to tell me, like, that Earth's magnetic field in this room is, like, 0.02 tes a millitesla or something like that. Yeah, like What's that device called? Magnetoscope. Magnetometer, maybe? How's that work? How do you detect the strength of a magnetic field? Calculate the force. It's actually with QVB. What you do is you have a block of metal like this. It's a metal that's kind of a rectangle shape. And you shoot current through the metal. Right? In other words, it's a, uh, it's a wire except it's a rectangular wire going this way. You shoot current this way. What way are the charges moving? Everybody pull out your right hand. What way are the charges moving? That way. Now, let's say you pushed a magnetic field up through that wire. What way would the positives be pushed? Towards the back of the room. And the negatives would be pushed towards the front of the room. So in other words, this side of the wire is going to be positive, and this side of the wire is going to be negative. Guess what you could do with that? Calculate the, Calculate the difference. Voltage difference. You stick a voltmeter on either side of the wire, and the voltmeter will tell you how strong the magnetic field is. That's how you, it's called a Hall effect probe. And you're oh. going to see some problems on this. Yeah, someone was trying to create a keyboard with Hall effect sensors. Yep. And that's it. And that's the, uh, that's it for today. <laughs>